And hello, everybody. You're very welcome to a new On Location episode. This is Sean Martin. And uh, Marco and I, even though he's not here, we're, we're on our way to InfoSecurity London. And InfoSecurity Europe in London, I should say. And we're excited to hear all kinds of things, obviously cyber related to business, policy and governance and in and, and public and private sector privacy. I'm sure we'll touch on there as well. All in the yeah, in support of enabling secure business, uh, protecting customers along the way. And uh, hopefully if we do our job right, uh, a safer society <laughs> that gets along and doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, attack each other <laughs> exactly so um yeah so as part of our coverage we uh we're, we're chatting with a few keynote speakers and i'm thrilled to have professor john goodacre on how are you john uh, very good thank you sean that's great you're a busy man researching stuff involved in programs uh attending and speaking at conferences um give us a little background on who professor goodacre is and and what you're up to these days yeah, so, you know, I've, I've had a varied career in telecoms. I spent six years at Microsoft in Redmond. I spent 17 years at ARM. And it was really on the back end of that ARM stuff that I started obviously being a professor doing supercomputers, which we're not going to talk about today. But the other thing that I started was uh, worrying about uh, our cyber resilience and integrity of our systems and whether or not there's more we can do than just patch and chase after bugs before the uh, attackers find their way in and take over our system. So that's really what I've been doing for the last five years. And I've been doing that as a director of a, a UK government program. So I'm sure we'll get into more details of that as we uh, talk this evening. But uh, John, I'm, I'm afraid that when we say we're going to take care of the uh, chasing patches around, chasing vulnerabilities with patches, we're gonna we're gonna take away some job security from folks. I think. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think there'll ever be a, a, a silver bullet. I was I was doing I was a, a colleague myself and a, a colleague or an ex colleague, I suppose. I suppose, I suppose we're still trying to attack this problem together. From from arm, we're giving governmental uh, select committee evidence uh, just last week, in fact, and we, he described it as a, a, a an ongoing battle, an arms race against the attackers. So. Yeah, I think that the big challenge really that we identified was that the uh, that, that things haven't really changed uh, for quite a long time, and it's just getting unsustainable for a lot of businesses and being able to maintain this. This is then obviously driving a skill shortage of people that can actually run around. So what 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 we looked at was actually is there a way of actually protecting people by design in the technology, and obviously in the UK government national strategy, we looked at bringing technology into the funding scheme. And it was that that scheme that actually started this uh, digital security by design program back in 20, 2019. And what we wanted to do was basically say, can we actually fix the foundation of technology so that it, the technology itself can protect us, as opposed to leaving it to the billions of users that use our digital systems to actually try to manage and de-risk themselves. So the program basically uh, kicked off then. It was a, at the time, it was a 70 million pound invest, investment by the UK government. But it really was to overcome a, a market failure. And because of that, we, we were basically the conveners, conveners where, with big business. And we had Microsoft, Google and others all basically promising, you know, at the time, over 100 million pounds of co-investment to say, can we fix the foundations of our, our digital infrastructures so that, you know, basically we can reduce that load. And, and that's what the program started to look at. And uh, obviously it was one that looked across the research part. It looked at the technology itself. It looked at how, what the impact to businesses were. And, you know, pr pretty unanimously, the, as people started looking at it, we can take out, well, Microsoft actually did a, a great paper, paper where they said, basically, if we look back in time at our last five years of patches that we've had to give out, this would have stopped 70 percent of them having to exist. So from that, you can start seeing that there's an ongoing cyber reduction. No silver bullet is not 100 percent or anything silly like that. But if you can take out 70 percent of the noise 
of of, of this. And uh, you know, since it, since that sort of started, it's it, you know we've 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 come up some good language. It's starting to go global and things like that. So, you know, happy to delve into any of those areas you think uh, it will be of interest. And obviously, in my talk uh, at, at the show, I'll be going into more details of how we've you know change the language into by design by default cyber security a pyramid if we can fix it you know with only a few hundred people looking at it but in effect billions it's you know how do you get a billion people not to click on the link quite hard how can we make it if a billion people click on the link nothing happens so so that's been our approach uh, uh, in the program basically to try to fix things by design in the products themselves at the lowest level of the foundational technology in the cpu if we get if we start getting techie if that's interesting yeah actually i wanted to actually uh start there because i know you have a lot of history in in uh the hardware right with, with arm certainly <clears throat> yeah um so that that's that's the base and then of course you have the network which is more hardware and then the networking uh, protocols yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you have the applications on top of that and then, and yeah, and that up, up to the users and so how how far and wide does this program cover? Are you working with hardware manufacturers, the software yeah, developers, uh, so the, the, the you know, telcos? Folks? Yeah, one of the one. Yeah, one of the things I'll be slide I'll be probably using at the presentation is a, some something I call the cyber pyramid, and it's a reverse pyramid where we're balanced on basically. Uh, at that point one, hurts. It's sitting under. Uh, that point really, really <laughs> hurts, and that point that uh, point of pain has actually been there for about fifty years. So, you know, computers back in the 40s and 50s, they were very expensive to build. The transistors, every transistor was really, really important. And obviously the cyber threat wasn't really there when we started. But by the 70s, even the American government was starting to publish things saying, we should probably change the way we run software on these chips because any mistake in the software, there's a, there's a class of problem called memory safety issues. Uh, a lot of people may have heard that coming out of the U.S., government in, in quite loud voice recently uh, that you know this huge amount of you know general problems that people accidentally or or as we've seen supply chain attacks actually start making problems in software that you know there's no defense in the hardware against basically starting executing code taking your data putting you to ransom and things like that so what we did in in the hardware or, or should i say there was a university of cambridge uh, here in the uk have been looking for about 10 years. What can we do to change the way hardware runs software so that these memory safety issues are not exploitable, but also how do we then put software, both the code and all the data in very fine grain boxes? Uh, it's called compartmentalization, but the idea that we can protect uh, or, or a developer can protect themselves against either explicit or accidental vulnerabilities in third-party code. And can we do this in the way that people write software today, which is a bit of that software, a bit of that software, let's glue it together and ship a product, yeah? No, nobody's going to rewrite the trillions of lines of code that they currently integrate in a different language that still isn't, you know, making a significant difference to the, the, to the, the risk of that system having uh, issues in the future. So, you know, what we've ended up with and what the program has been able to show in the last five years is that we, yeah, we, we stop those vulnerabilities. We've shown that the developers can have a significant production, uh, sorry, productivity gain in the sense that things that, that may be slightly wrong in their design or their implementation are caught very quickly. And then obviously in the deployment of it, the fact that those customers don't have to run around patching quite as often. And, you know, things that today are very serious day zero bugs, you know, let's look at the, the WebP ones recently where somebody could just send an image to you by whatever means and take over your entire handset or, or computer. Not a good environment to be in, whereas the bug may have still existed, but run it on this kind of hardware, it would have been nothing worst case a crash best case i say sorry invalid image you know it's that kind of change that we're looking at uh, bringing through to the platform and obviously in the in my talk i'll be covering more you know how does it do it how do we get that into the supply chain how customers access the technology where is it actually coming from and that going back to the pyramid there's only really three architectures, the ARM architecture, the RISC-V architecture, and the x86 architecture. Mm -hmm. Fix it in those three, 
and you've actually got the billions and billions of devices across the world in all sectors or markets uh, having this level of upgrade if you like to the way that hardware runs software interesting so i'm trying to trying to picture this is uh i don't want to demean it but is it a shim between the hardware and the applications or what's that look well like? there, there is a shim it's called an instruction set architecture so basically hardware has a contract with software it says if you show me this instruction to add two numbers then i'll add two numbers together for you okay so it's at that fundamental level of hardware and software if it says if this value is greater than one then jump else don't jump it's that instruction within the computer that's changing and at the moment the computer has a view that if i've got an integer value a number then i can use that to point at memory and read the memory okay uh, or if that's on the stack i've got a string on the stack a, a sequence of characters oh let's make it a bit longer oh those characters are now instructions please when you return off the stack start running my code so those kind of things are basically inherent in the mistakes of software and i don't think anybody i found no, I don't think I found anybody that will say there's never a bug in software. And I found, you know, some fairly high integrity. Well, there's a reason the OWASP top 10 has lasted for so many years, right? With, yeah. With and, 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 basically you know, the same list. and about five or six of those top 10 mm -hmm. classes of errors are all of these memory problems, you know, using something that was freed, writing off the end of a buffer, you know, open SSL, heart bleed, reading off the end of a buffer so I can go and get hold of your keys and your password. Those are all the kind of things that if you don't just use an integer, but you use something called a capability that the hardware says, I can only read what I've been given permission to read or write or execute at a very fine grain, high performance way, then hey, presto, it's a, the world's a much better and safer place to work and your systems are more resilient and the integrity of your data and operations are higher. So it's not something that you, effectively buy and apply it's not a tool it's not a monitoring tool it's not a piece of software that you run on your system it's changing the way you know computers historically have run code to run it in a way that protects you against exploitation and allows you to yes you, know, you know constrain you know your, your image viewer it's a good example because it's been quite popular recently as a, a way into a system put it in a box and it can only write to its image decode buffer. It can't go reading and writing the, the boot vector of your code and taking your you know, your money out of your bank. So, right. so obviously, it's just an eye and things is a different <laughs> case. But yeah, <laughs> you know, there's all good things. Yeah. So yeah, so many questions in my mind. Uh, go for it. <laughs> uh, let's see. So uh, let's go here first. So, actually, I spoke with uh, Bob Lord. He's with CISA. Yeah. Part of uh, DHS. And um, we we talked a bit about secure by design software. Then they have an, a basically a, an effort underway to, to to tackle the same issue around memory memory issues in in applications. My question is: Are are you working with DHS, CISA, or other government yeah, entities yeah. to to kind of make yeah, this broader? To, uh, uh, yeah, I've been over to the states and the agencies quite a few times over the years, sort of sharing this view that, you know, we can no longer just do cybersecurity where the user of the system is responsible and liable for its operation. We have to go to two two lower levels. The first lower level is by default, where those manufacturers are taking more care about not shipping such a large attack surface at us. You know, don't turn on features that don't shouldn't be turned on and don't ship as default passwords we have actually recently in the uk uh, law made that illegal to ship as a pos a product a consumer product with default passwords now and then the layer beneath that where the products and the components actually by design in their implementation can help protect us now i think that the the language of you know user memory safe language is great uh, obviously that doesn't very well address the historical legacy of everything and what we're we're saying is great story here's a roadmap that can actually bring legacy under that protection as well so and office and actually for even if you do start writing rust and other memory safe languages you know they have an unsafe component to them uh, run that rust on these platforms you now have that unsafe component also protected from memory safety 
and this idea that even if you're writing in memory safe language or a, a legacy language, you can start constraining and bringing in policies between libraries in your code, between functions and data structures that, again, can operate at very high performance. We're seeing some of the, you know, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, our listeners have heard some of the vulnerabilities in our cloud stack recently and our virtualization things. And the idea that you can now put that same software into these boxes and basically run it, you know, orders of magnitude faster. Uh, it's all sort of a positive sort of uh, way, you know, let's design a computer which runs code differently, can still run the existing code. The cost of change and the cost of adoption is minimal. You know, that we've shown in this, there's actually more lines of code running on this platform than there have ever been lines of code in the open source for Rust, for example. And obviously the rate of authorship of legacy language non-safe code is faster than the rate that they're writing it back in new languages. So this is a divergent problem, not a convergent problem. So what can we do about it? And obviously my talk will be covering what's happening and what needs to happen in the future and what people need to know about it to be able to start of you know, pulling this through the supply chain and creating roadmaps in which you know the businesses themselves can obviously start benefiting from the reduction of that uh, the threat against them. It's a de-risking uh, strategy for cybersecurity. You know, let's fix some of those root problems, not just band-aid it with patches. Yeah. Yep. Uh, or or policy. <laughs> and, well, and, policy. Aud and audits that take up a bunch of time as well. Yeah. Um, well, clearly, if we can have some uh, language of you know, it's it, in some senses, I think it's almost becoming socially unacceptable, isn't it, to be shipping yeah. products that can still be attacked in ways that we know how to attack them and. You know, even school kids are taught at school, you know, what a memory, you know, buffer overflow is. And it doesn't take them long to realize that they can just send a few extra characters and start executing random code. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, we've just got to get rid of that as soon as yep. we can. And it's, it's now really a business adoption and commercial and policy kind of discussion on how do we protect ourselves? You know, and it's a global problem. Yeah. How do yeah. all the governments get together and basically say, hey, suppliers, start doing this by design and by default otherwise the cyber security and the billions of peoples and the businesses and the digital economy benefits are all at threat aren't they basically and it's uh you know i think we went from was it eighteen thousand reported vulnerabilities a year and a bit ago to thirty thousand this year you know people are doing a lot to reduce it but the amount of digital code that's been written oh yeah and the ferocity of people attacking systems the number of vulnerabilities is going up exponentially if you look at the charts yeah yeah no i don't necessarily want to head down this path but the the ai writing code is just gonna <laughs> amp amp amplify all those bugs right and, and well you know well i think there's a, there's a there's a there's a there's a few things around ai obviously you know ai can attack ai can defend and tell you what's going on a lot faster than a lot of uh, socks can run around and see it but then the other part of ai is it's also uh, an area under that could be under attack itself so if you've got an ai that's doing some recognition or is something wrong it's running on this huge stack of legacy code operating systems and uh, you know interpreters you know it's it's just a data structure in memory that can be tweaked by a buffer overflow in the decoder of the network stack you know it's it's just as vulnerable as everybody else. It's not, you know, it's not the answer to everything. It's yep. clearly going to, you know, escalate the rate at which vulnerabilities can be exploited <laughs> or detected or seen. But it's, you know, the it, it itself is going to be vulnerable. But also, you know, if you start looking at the inference models between I own the model and that's my value, and I and I want to sell it to somebody so they can spot smiley cats, you know, how do you protect your IP? You know. Because clearly you're under a, a threat that somebody can take your model and your business is gone. So, you know, this is where the containerization can help for AI as well. You know, separate the model from the interpret from the rest of the system and you're protecting your IP as well. So, the, the, you know, there's lots of stories uh, and it's just a case of prioritizing which ones are the, the key ones that are going to cause it to be ubiquitous across the uh, the whole of the sector, all, all the sectors. Yep. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things that that you shared prior to uh, recording the the this mindset that we have to 
establish and then that starts with some awareness with some training and education uh can you touch on that a, a bit for me yeah so so if if you know what i said earlier that these problems are, have been in the computer architectures for 50 years okay obviously not all of that time it was under threat and under under attack but but in essence how many people are as old as me that can remember that there was actually different types of computers back in the 60s and early yeah, we had stack-based list machines that didn't run with this idea that a single number can read all your memory. But that, you know, by the by the mid seventies, early eighties, that was the ubiquitous model that you have an integer number and it can read all your memory. Now, obviously, there's been things stuck on the side since, and you know, trying to constrain how much it can read. But they're very expensive to implement uh, a lot of those those partitions. So, you know, how we take that forwards, it's you know up for discussion but uh, please you know i don't think i fully answered your question there so <laughs> go back and ask me again <laughs> <laughs> well i'm just wondering uh, so new stuff i think we need to create with secure by design secure by default in in mind right so yes we have the legacy we need to come to a certain point where we're protecting a lot of that and then new stuff moving forward um, so how, how do we get to a point where we can scale secure by design, secure by default? Um, yeah, so, make a difference there. So obviously the by, de by design for me, it, it's uh, just geeking out for a moment. It's, it's all about abstractions and the leakage of data across abstractions. OK, so the whole of our digital economy is built on abstractions whether or not it's the way a transistor works in analog and electricity so you can side channel attack through heat, or whether or not it's the hardware software division, or whether or not it's the operating system application boundary, or whether or not it's the driver. It's all the abstractions that are leaking. So, you know, in, in essence, it's bringing that into the education of the people who are working either to provide the abstraction, that's where the by design bit comes, or the people that are using abstractions, and that's where the by default comes. So if I'm a designer of a product that's integrating and shipping a whole load of abstractions and a whole load of functionality, I better understand the, by default, I need to design this to be more secure. And if I'm shipping that abstraction, I'm shipping the transistor, the hardware chip, the network stack, the protocol interface, I better not do things that aren't by design working. So. You know, the, you know, obviously I've spoken about this memory safety by design, but there's, there's other ones. Where do I hold the magic key, the keys of the system? Okay. Have I designed it in a way that it just sits in that flat memory space that allows people to read it? Well, 80 or 90% of the chips, that's true today. But there's a growing number of them that are putting in roots of trust and they're putting in protected stores and things like that. So it's an educational thing that the peaceful using it, those developers at the top actually knowing that says, well, is what I'm buying got by design capabilities in it so that it makes my life and protects me against any mistakes I might make in my level of the supply chain? Obviously, the, the, the big recent news on the supply chain was that one that was going into the SSL stack for uh, Linux recently. And again, you know, you could say, well, I want to use a library. I might not know it's full providence i better be able to put it in a box protect myself by design that those libraries i'm using there's no way that they can get out and start doing things that they weren't expected to do so you know we do you know we're starting to see that in the uk here we've got something called sidebox it's a long list of educational <laughs> areas of interest and we're feeding into that that becomes basically what the the, the academia or the teaching community then spreads out to through their teachings so you know hopefully we'll get this concept but i think just getting the language and starting to see examples of this coming through the supply chain will obviously hopefully pique the interest of you know component developers the hardware developers the system software getting them in the application spaces and then at the top we're seeing it with governments reporting like your CISA, as you say putting out Go and do this stuff. Watch your roadmap to memory safety, guys. Watch your roadmap to by default. You know, in the UK here, we've got our PSDI bill. You better make sure you know how to upgrade and support your devices and not put default passwords on them. So, you know, I think the language is getting there. I think there's a global 
alignment coming in that. Yes, there's a focus on what I can do today in writing in memory safe languages, but you know, like I say, there's an unsafe bit in that as well. It doesn't just because I wrote it in Rust doesn't mean it's memory safe. You know, it's a, it's an interesting one. Just because I run it on a memory safe chip, it doesn't mean it's memory safe either. Well, some of the microcontroller stuff we're doing, it is. But uh, you know, it's a, it's an educational step, and obviously, the reason I'm sh offering to share my talk uh, next week is is to make sure that more people know about this uh, this hierarchy, this, these areas of responsibility, rather than just saying cybersecurity. Yeah. Have you packed? Do you know what your SOC is? Do you know what your risk mitigation is? Do you know what your recovery mechanism is? Yeah. Yes, it's very important. You need to know all those because you've got attacks that aren't, <laughs> aren't, aren't at technology level. But, you know, if we can do something about the technology level and the threats that they're bringing, then you can start worrying about the real ones, which is, you know, am I running the right functionality at the right time for the right people? Yep. Yeah, then we're going to focus on the uh, the logic part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was funny. I was, I, there, there was a big workshop that was looking at uh, si the growth and the skills requirement for cybersecurity. So they were saying we need more people to understand how to protect their systems and how to run monitoring. I was going, look, let me paint that as a slightly different picture for you. Ultimate success. 90% of your population in employment is running around patching your systems, knowing how to run it. Is that the economic growth and <laughs> prosperity you want? And they went, oh. Yeah, no. OK, so what you really want is to make their lives easier so they can focus you know, sustainably at what's required, which is, you know, offering great service and doing it in a resilient and uh, high integrity way. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I've, I've had this conversation a few times and it, it, I don't know, I'm a nerd this way. It rolls around in my head almost 24 or 7 that I, I believe security has knowledge and data and experience if applied at a business level, just to, I mean, we spend tons of money on marketing, right? To fine tune the, the, the qualified yeah. lead to deal, right? If we, if we did that math, looking at uh, how do we, how do we tune business operations, business processes um, so that they stay up all the time and they can't be compromised. It, it, security is a yeah. real hot, interesting one to understand what the economic or roi return on investment for security is because you know we've we yeah you know, there's there's one of our demonstrators that's basically converted the entire stack right there from the boot up to the graphical browser in it's in a something called cherry bsd it's a bsd linux like environment uh, and they they tried to demo it and someone said yeah it's a computer what what's the value of that above that one and it's it's actually very hard to sort of say well it's not as vulnerable. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm finding lots of businesses and sectors that go, and yeah, my mitigation is in place. If I get attacked, I know how to recover. Tell me again why I need to change what I'm doing. And it, it you know, how do we get them to realize that, you know, it's not the attack you've not had, it's the one you're about to have. And, you know, it's that threat and that cost that's going to really struggle. I think I saw a number from, uh, was it McKinsey recently that it was around ten trillion dollars lost in IP and attack and maintenance out of the global GDP? Okay, ten trillion. That's uh, you know, if we can halve, if we can halve that, that wouldn't be bad, would it? <laughs> yeah, that put a few pennies in everybody's pocket. A few bob in my pocket for sure. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, John, um, a fascinating conversation. I, I feel we could continue to dig deeper. And maybe, I don't know, maybe after uh, Info Security Europe, we can do that, have another yeah. chat. Yeah, no, um, I, uh, I definitely am excited for your for your talk. This, uh, progress for the DSBD initiative, which is what we've been talking about here today, and yeah. the Cherry Capability Hardware, which is what you just referenced. That's on uh, the keynote stage, Tuesday the 4th, 1230, half 12, their uh, local time. And... Uh, yeah yeah i'm excited to hear uh hear what you have to say yeah with pictures rather than just my hands Ooh, waving. look at that italian style hopefully we'll catch a few people on this and uh, i'll be around all day so you can't miss me a bright red head yeah i've got red there shirt. You go. long red, red head hair. red shirt Perfect. yeah come and say hey john i heard your talk i'd really <laughs> like to know about this 
and I'll say, yeah, 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 and come and see me, and yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll change the world. That that was the first thing I did when I started the program. I stood up in front of the, it was a small, fairly small ecosystem at the time, about twenty people. We're here to change the world. Yeah, and stand up now. Right. We've got about four or five hundred in the ecosystem. Right. So yeah, let's keep keep it going. Going. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it everybody at some point with awareness. All right on. Right on. Well, John, it's been a pleasure chatting with Thank you, and you. Uh, congratulations on getting this spot to raise awareness for this at the conference. And uh, looking forward to the to the, the presentation and the conversations that uh, come with it after. And mm -hmm. uh, you're very welcome back anytime. And for everybody listening. Please do follow. We have lots of chats on the road to InfoSecurity Europe in London. Uh, Mark and I will be there on site uh, to catch up with folks as well. Lots of stories, lots of cool stuff going, including what John's talking about uh, Tuesday, the 4th, half 12 there. So, John, thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>